as he stresses, the temperature gets cooler because the blood vessels constrict when you tense and stress. And as you relax, they dilate. We'll talk a little bit more about this, quite a bit more about this as we get into it. sensitive here. And that's always the sound goes down. up, the tone goes up. Yeah, the place. tone goes up as you uh, relax and it goes down as you uh, you try too hard to relax. <laughs> it seems like it should be the other way around. Yeah, well, we'll, expl <laughs> we'll explain how this works in a, in a little while here. You can be very, you can set the threshold yeah. opposite. That would yeah, yeah. You can individualize. Yeah, very sleepy. But I know what you mean. That's more of a harsh. Yeah. And that seems more of a harsh. Yeah, that's good. So the sound goes down, the temperature goes up. Yeah. So, Kevin, if you would like to uh, give us an introduction. Sure. <laughs> and uh, then we'll get started here. spontaneous inspiration during one of the mindfulness and meditation laboratories. I wow, here at Google, you know, with the emphasis on science and technology, it could be a perfect place to introduce and offer this, these tools that can really augment meditation practice. Because in the mindfulness and, and meditation laboratory, we're learning to uh, deepen our awareness to a more subtle threshold, more subtle level that we can pick up whispers and cues of tension before they actually, you know, are giving us screaming headaches. Or, and also to, bring, to just become aware of our heartbeat, and our pulse, and our breath, and just, you know, on, on a subtler level. And the, the uh, technology boosts the amplitude of the signal. So the two together really give you, um, can accelerate the results. Feedback, uh, biofeedback, either with sound or numbers, you'll, you'll see it in different displays, tell you when you're moving towards the target, when you're moving towards, depending on whatever it is that your, um, your goal, whether it's relaxation or greater focus and clarity and concentration, when you're moving toward that or when you're moving away from it. So the feedback will change. And as with everything else, feedback and learning go this gives you moment-to-moment -moment real time feedback when the mind started to wander rather than five or ten minutes later, or maybe a half an hour <laughs> later, you wake up. <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah, I was trying to focus on my breath. And I got carried away. This tells you in an instant that you start to wander away, you know, the opportunity to come back. So you, your concentration and focus really become more sustained and stronger. So it was an inspiration to just be able to share that also to see where your creativity and intuition could potentially even advance the, uh, the action. Um, explore some new frontiers for my feedback. So it's both in the, in the realm of, of reducing the noise, reducing the stress in the system, and also augmenting creativity, focus, and optimizing the whole spectrum. Right. So just briefly here to give a little taste. <coughs> We've got Duncan hooked up here on 
thermal biofeedback. So he's got a little electronic temperature sensor hooked to his finger. And the, the people in the back want to just scoot on up. So you can see, and you know, we're just kind of in the circle in conversation. That's great. So, um, um, so basically, uh, take a look at your hands for just a moment. And he, Duncan, by the way, has worn, warmed up about 15 degree, degrees from when you started. Do you yeah. remember what you started yeah. at? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got to like search to get him on the scale here. So. Mm -hmm. There we go. So basically, as he goes up, the uh, the little uh, line will go up. As he uh, cools, it will go down. And the principle here is that control and choice follow awareness. No, and the feedback enhances our awareness. It's like learning to manage. Yeah, so pause for a moment and just think about all the things in your life that you, that feedback is required to learn, okay? And, and give us some examples. What are some things that, that without feedback, there's no way you'd be able to learn? Play an instrument. Okay, I like an instrument. If you couldn't hear, it would be pretty hard. Uh, other examples? Driving. Driving. <laughs> Yeah, the stakes are kind of high with that, so you really need to pay attention. Uh, any other examples? Walking. Walking. Is there anything you need? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so are we all convinced Cooking. that there's nothing you can learn without feedback? You know, ask your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend. So, so in this case, we've got Duncan hooked up to uh, temperature, really sent easy hookup. You know, great for demos. And um, look at your hands for a moment, okay? And just check them out and realize that in the hands are irrigated by the, the blood vessels, okay? And the blood vessels are part of this enclosed elastic hydraulic system that has about 16 pounds of, uh, pints of blood in it. So, um, when your blood pressure goes up, what do you think, and all, most of the muscles in the blood vessels are aligned with, uh, uh, most of the blood vessels are aligned with muscles. Under stress, guess what happens to those muscles? So they constrict, and as the blood vessels constrict, would your hands tend to get warmer or colder? Colder, because the blood's getting uh, clamped off to that, and if your blood vessels are clamping down like that, uh, would you guess that your blood pressure would be going up or going down? Going up. So, therefore, if you wanted to learn how to control your blood pressure, what would you want to learn how to do? Warm your hand. Relax, dilate the blood vessels. Oh, and, and relax those tight little muscles inside the blood vessels so that the heart doesn't have to push so hard to get the blood where it needs to go. And um, let's have a little blood pressure uh, cup that was here. Yes. I'll pass this around during the uh, presentation. And if you'd like to uh, play with this a little bit, it's not a thermal feedback device, but it's actually an uh, actual uh, blood pressure monitor. You just put it around your wrist like this, and then push start or stop, and uh, then it will inflate, and it will give you your pulse and your blood pressure. And what I suggest is try it two or three times. Maybe uh, really hold the first time doing nothing, second time doing whatever you know how to do to relax. Maybe another time relaxing and just see what happens. If it goes up when you're trying to relax, it probably means you're trying too hard. So it's giving you feedback on that. So I'll pass this around. It can be a really good little uh, device. So we'll explore a number of different kinds of biofeedback today, um, the thermal being one. And I'll be going back and forth between the uh, active screens and the information screens. Um, our goals for this session are to give you an introduction to what biofeedback is. 
And uh, as you'll learn, biofeedback includes neurofeedback, which is feedback from the brain, many other modalities. We'll talk about how biofeedback relates to mindfulness and meditation that we've been exploring in some of the classes here at Google. We'll give a demonstration of some different modalities of biofeedback and talk about their applications traditionally. And then we'll also take some time and talk about some of the emerging frontiers of biofeedback, neurofeedback training. And hopefully we'll take some time and consider, so what does this mean for the world, uh, for, for uh, humanity, and potentially for you as a bunch of really creative techies that once you understand how this work might go, wow, we could do some serious advancement of this if uh, we could find a way to interface with that. Um, and then the second hour, we'll have time, more hands-on for whoever would like to actually explore, play, get hooked up, experiment. So there's this notion that the greatest thing in all education is to make the nervous system our our ally instead of, instead of our enemy. And uh, if we look at um, the work we've done with the Mindfulness and Meditation Laboratory, it, let's say this is the threshold of your awareness before you began training in mindfulness or meditation. Um, through the process of developing more mindfulness, becoming more present, listening and feeling and, and experiencing things at subtler and subtler levels, the threshold of our awareness drops to subtler and subtler levels so that we refine that awareness until over time what was previously unconscious below the threshold of our awareness is now conscious because it's above the threshold of our awareness. Uh, with biofeedback training, in a sense, we cheat and it allows us to slap a sensor on the signal generator, let's say, of temperature. It's pretty unlikely that without a bit of training, you're going to notice fluctuations of temperature in your fingers of a hundredth of a degree. But with this stuff, you can. So with biofeedback, we slap a sensor on it, boost the signal, and bring it up to the level of awareness. And then if we're paying attention to the feedback by with our mindfulness, then we can create this feedback loop that rapidly accelerates the acquisition of the skills. And to keep in mind, the applications of biofeedback training are not only to reduce pain and stress, in the sense to turn down the noise in our systems, but we can also use biofeedback training to improve the quality of our attention, our creativity, our self-mastery, our, our confidence, and our ability to actually stay healthier and more resilient in the face of disease. A lot of athletes are using this, and we'll talk about that. Um, as we go along here. So it's both to reduce the noise and to boost the music. Um, you could say that you know most of us have been doing the best we can with uh, what we've known so far, and that this kind of training really helps us understand how our personal operating systems can work more efficiently. A couple of our mentors from the Menninger Foundation um, came up with this um, psychophysiological axiom. And it basically says that every change in the, uh, the body is accompanied by a change in the state of mind or the emotions. And every change in the, the emotions or the state of mind is also reflected in, the state, in a change in the state of the body. And as we learn to understand and pay attention to that in subtler and subtler ways, we can have more and more control. Uh, at UCLA, a group of 40 scientists met together for over a year trying to define what the mind is, and they said that the human mind is a relational and embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information. And in this case, when we're working with biofeedback, we're regulating the flow of energy and information generally speaking, inside of our own body, uh, rather than just letting unconscious habit and stress rule and feel victimized by circumstances. One of the best biofeedback training laboratories on the planet is at um, West Point Military Academy. They've got an incredible array of, of uh, technology, like we'll be demonstrating today, uh, really sophisticated protocols 
we were invited to uh, do some teaching there at one point and talk about our work with the Green Berets. Um, and the main uh, factors that they uh, look at in terms of training the mind to be able to, for a greater peak performance and self-mastery are to have a good cognitive understanding of what we're talking about in terms of different practices, clear goals and intentions, uh, developing mindfulness and mastery of attention, the capacity for visualization and creative imagination, and the ability to recognize and ma manage or master stress. The unfortunate thing about their incredible lab is that most of the people coming to use it, the cadets in training are so exhausted that when they get into the mind room and they're all hooked up and all this technology is telling them about the subtlest little changes inside of them and they're doing their relaxation exercises or their meditation. <laughs> they just fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> So it was really frustrating for a lot of people who were training them. So again, creating a little bit more context here, um, our, our mentors at uh, uh, Menninger Foundation, two of our mentors, at one point they brought in a yogi who was an engineer from India named Swami Rama. And they hooked up temperature sensors like Duncan was hooked up with. They put one here on his hand and one there on his hand. You know, like two inches apart, and they said, Swamiji, see how much of a difference you can create in the, the temperature in these two areas by redistributing the blood flow with your mind. And you can see here, you know, one of them he made go up, and one he made go down. The, the one that went down got kind of white, pasty, and cold to the touch. The other area was, was actually red and you know, hot, warm to the touch in a 15-minute period, he made a 17-degree di difference in the temperature. And a student, a graduate student at Kansas State University said, wow, I wonder if you could learn how to do that in black with biofeedback. And he got uh, a system, and he hooked up a couple sensors, and he started working on it. Um, the yogi, they, they, when they, he had done that in the lab, they said, Swamiji, how long did you have to train well, to have so that, excited that kind of control? You know, if we could teach people to do this, they could stave off the cancer to their tumors, or they could increase the blood flow to an area of inflammation. You know, this is incredible. How much mind training did it take? And he said, oh, 23, 24 <laughs> years maybe. At which point they all got kind of <laughs> The student who did the biofeedback training to get there, guess how long it took him to be able to, to reach the same level of mastery in terms of redistributing the blood flow with his mind and with the aid of the technology? A couple weeks. It took him two weeks. So the, the feedback really closes that loop Whereas you know, it may take a while to refine your awareness and your listening to be able to distinguish that. Like if any of you play a guitar and you've got one of those Radio Shack things that you can you know, set down and automatically tune things and tell you when you're in the perfect. It may take a long time to train your ear, but the technology can really accelerate. So in our work, um, we've, uh, I used to run the biofeedback and stress management program at Group Health. Uh, we've done a lot of kid work with kids, Michelle. I ran the biofeedback and stress center at Children's Hospital here in Seattle, and children just love to play with this technology, and they're really good at it. No one told them they couldn't do it. So they're like totally, and they'll stay in from recess to stay, see how much, how hot they can get their hands, you know, and take it into schools as well. It's a wonderful uh, tool. We've also done a lot of this work, you know, with executive training for uh, leadership development and with stressed out executives. We've also trained quite a few athletes. Uh, Cheryl Merrick and Estelle Gray, a couple of local gals, um, set the ride, the tan, women's tandem record for the Ram, the Ride Across America, from Santa Monica Pier to New York City. And their record has stood for over 25 years. I was, I think, 10 hours. 43 minutes and 22 seconds. 10 days. 10 days. Yeah, yeah 10 days, nice 10 record. days, 43 <laughs> minutes, 22 <laughs> seconds, something like that. But um, they trained really hard to be able to manage their energy really hyper-efficiently so that they wouldn't burn out on the ride. 
Um, Cheryl actually set the world's record for the number of miles on a bicycle in one day and uh, did almost 700 miles in one day at one time. But they used to go in for their uh, physiological exams and they'd just get hooked up to things and they'd totally mess with the technicians because they'd take their blood pressure way up and then they'd take it way down and they'd play with their heartbeat and stuff and they'd totally mess with them. Um, really great examples. Another athlete we trained with was the uh, uh, world record holder um, in archery. Olympic gold. Olympic gold medal archery for years and years. He was pretty much unbeatable. Another big project we worked on was the uh, Jedi Warrior Program for the U.S. Army uh, Special Forces. And uh, for that we had about $200,000 worth of this technology in a lab teaching the men how to control anything you could attach a sensor to basically. Um, they were operating in cold weather environments. We taught them how to keep their hands warm so they wouldn't get frostbite, how to manage their stress. Um, we even developed a system that allowed 16 people to be hooked up at the same time and to synchronize their brain waves with each other, which was a wonderful um, new piece of technology that we so, um, and later on in the presentation, we'll talk about some of the uh, farther reaches of this in terms of extraordinary human performance. <laughs> um, as Arnold Schwarzenegger says, uh, a pump when I picture the muscle I want is worth 10 with my mind drifting. Uh, this kind of training really teaches you how to put your mind intimately into the part of your body that you're controlling. And even though you may not know quite what you're doing, with the feedback, you, you get the information that tells you when you're on track. So I'm going to grab a few notes here and run through the side. Um, I'd like to thank Hal Myers from Thought Technologies. Um, he's really generously supplied us with a lot of equipment over the years. And some of these slides in this set um, are coming from him. They were just simple to use, and uh, so we'll talk to that. So biofeedback's a technique that helps us enhance our personal awareness and control over our minds and bodies. It uses electronic sensors to monitor the physiological signals, such as heart rate, blood pressure, skin temperature, um, brain waves, and then it feeds that information back to you. If you go to your physician and he checks your blood pressure, he monitoring your blood pressure but if you hook yourself up like with the little instrument that's passing around or to an instrument like this and you can create a feedback loop with it real time then very quickly you can begin to discern what states of mind are going to take the signal up or take it down and the really really exciting thing with this technology is basically anything you can attach a sensor to be it Kevin's brain or Duncan's hand or um, or your blood pressure anything that we can measure and feed back to somebody you can learn how to control so some of the farther reaches here would mean like if we once the um, sensors get more and more sensitive you could imagine a diabetic with a little photoplethysmic uh, finger cuff measuring blood chemistry giving real-time feedback on blood sugar levels and then them being able to go into meditations and adjust their internal metabolic state to self-medicate for diabetes or a whole host of other conditions that, that are controlled by the different neuropeptides in the blood system. So if you can measure it, you can control it. So why use biofeedback? Um, generally, uh, Biofeedback shares several core beliefs and values of complementary medicine and alternative medicine. It requires adopting a really holistic view of the mind and body working together. And it encourages us to take an active role in our health rather than just possibly passively popping pills or having somebody else do manipulations for us. It says, look, moment to moment, we're going towards stress or towards wellness. Uh, do you know which direction you're heading right now? Turn around <laughs> if you like. And we oftentimes say that control follows awareness. And this approach is really in sharp contrast to the use of medications and 
other invasive techniques where somebody else is doing it to you. And in that, it's probably the most empowering use of technology on the planet, which for me is super exciting when you're working with teenagers or young kids or populations that tend to feel kind of victimized, and like, I don't have any control, they've got all the control, the world's doing it to me, and then they learn that they can warm their hands or relax their muscles or control their brain waves or win a race with, by using their mind and their confidence becomes unshakable. So to me, that's probably the most important thing that happens through biofeedback training is that people really develop an understanding that gives them a sense of greater control and confidence in their life. Uh, biofeedback's ideal for people who don't necessarily uh, respond well to traditional treatments and uh, where they prefer to self-regulate rather than self-medicate. Many different kinds of sensors that can be used. We can measure the, the, um, the electrical conductance of the skin. Uh, with, uh, we can measure the... Which is also related to stress. Yeah. You know, sweaty palms. You know, it's like, oh, where are my keys? And you get, you know, sweaty armpits and your hands get... Earlier, I couldn't get something on the computer to work, and I said, my GSR is going up, my skin conductance. And you can just feel moisture happening as a stress response. Uh, we can measure brain waves by attaching sensors to the, to the skull. We can measure muscle tension by hooking up in various uh, ways. Uh, we can measure peripheral blood flow by a little finger sensor. We can measure respiration, the patterns of breathing, by putting sensors around the chest and the belly. Uh, temperature by a little thermometer. and. Um, other feedback like force, angle, sound, uh, by different kinds of sensors. And the kinds of technology ranges from small little handheld devices. Uh, this one's a classic. It's been on the market for probably about 30 years now. To, you know, like full on, full arrays of, you know, multiple sensors on the skull and peripheral sensors all being fed back to a person at home. In, in Kevin's case, we have two sites right now hooked up when we start to get And the goal with uh, the EEG training um, is really uh, neurofeedback, which is a form of biofeedback that measures the, uh, the brain waves or the EEG, um, measures both the fast brain waves and the slow brain waves um, and cortical potentials within the skull. And the goal of the neurofeedback training is to help uh, people to enhance their normal EEG pattern uh, while they're involved in specific activities. And where the EEG training is most widely used is uh, like with kids with learning uh, uh, disorders or attention deficit disorders, um, working a lot with veterans with post-traumatic stress, um, working with people with migraine headaches. So, uh, and, meditators. and meditators, you know, a lot of people that are very interested in consciousness research, how their brain's working. So let's see if we can get a brainwave out of Kevin here. <laughs> see what's happening. Just close out the screen. Let's see. And uh, Michelle, any stories you want to share with <laughs> Well, just one story that found when we were um, getting ready to do the Army project and we had designed this new system to for whole teams to train together so that they could learn to be more in tune with each other and they would get signals when they're all hitting, not just individual feedback, but uh, uh, feedback when everyone was coming into sync at whatever the established level, in this case alpha, we were working with alpha brainwave training, which is a, a calm but very alert, awake person. It's not this dreamy, uh, uh, like a theta is slower brainwave. And oftentimes in meditation, we learn to keep ourselves conscious and awake as we go into that slower brainwave state. So it's kind of an alpha theta combination. So most of us, without training, when our brains go slow enough for theta, we'll tend to just either daydream or fall asleep. But it's actually a very creative state, the theta, theta wave state, to be able to bring presence into it can be very helpful to bring awakeness. In the uh, 
case of the Nuts Creek. Uh, got a whole beautiful rainbow display. Yeah, but before we went into the training, Joe and I were running ourselves on the equipment just to test different meditations and mindfulness to see what the signature of the different practices, which were really good for concentration. We get wonderful sounds. You could have your eyes open or closed. And we would be in the lab for like eight hours a day, just running ourselves through these different meditations and different protocols to see what effect they had. We got to like, it was, it was like a kid in a candy shop. We got to, you know, glue our, have our, our whole brain sensors um, hooked up so that we could try every meditation and practice to you know, learn and to see how that was affected. But the, the, the greatest teaching, which I didn't realize, was just having that moment-to-moment -moment feedback that I mentioned earlier so that you'd have a sound when you're coming on alpha. And then the moment the mind would wander, the music would go off or it would not be that beautiful sound. So that being able to build the, sustain the uh, attention that continuously without slipping was such an uh, altered, you know, created such a, an altered state of consciousness. We, we had to we would go out and just throw frisbee after, you know, get barefoot on the grass. We were, it, we were so like in a different state of mind just to be able to like even drive. It was amazing just how, um, Focused, but a different kind of focus, you know, not just a tight focus. It was just a very expansive, creative space of being. And kind of um, amazing to see what that kind of continuous attention for eight hours a day would produce. That's a story. Okay, great. Are we ready? Yeah. So, uh, some of you who may have been watching this uh, to begin with as Kevin began noticed that he started with a lot of uh, big spikes in the red there, which was mostly just uh, muscle tension. Um, and after probably about 10, 15 seconds of getting uh, that feedback, and I said, try and make the red go away, <laughs> um, he was able to bring it down like that. And uh, so basically what we've got here is uh, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. This is the frequency from zero cycles a second to 64 cycles a second. This is time, so it's um, basically, and this is the amplitude, the strength of the signal. So you're basically getting the power gradients, the frequency distribution off of both uh, parts of the brain, and that's the raw EEG up on the, uh, on the top there. And um, whenever there's like a big red spike that goes up, that's probably an eye blink or a, uh, a jaw clench. The muscles really overwhelm the brain with. And if any of you ever saw that really cool TED talk where they have this great head sensor mm -hmm. and they're controlling stuff with their brain, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I have to say I really think that's not what's going on. That um, because unless they teach people to totally relax all the muscles there and the jaw and all that, probably what people were doing to control whatever they were controlling with that was just the muscles of the the head and they were just hyping it as as neurofeedback because the, the the muscles are above you know thousands of times more powerful in terms of the signal they put out than the bursts of electric activity of the neurons firing which are like millions of a volt rather than thousands of a volt so um, and Kevin, any uh, observations that you've had when you talk? It's going to make it really noisy, but just anything I'm that you've seen. <laughs> it's, it's really subtle. It's and very it's subtle. Any yeah. amount of tension just makes the red spike. Like yeah. Red. All the times when we're doing biofeedback training with people, we'll start with um, teaching people how to get control over the the less subtle, like our muscles, to reduce tension. And either a lot of people carry tension in their shoulders or forehead or you know, on the jaw, and have people learn how to reduce on the work with EMG feedback and, and reduce the muscle tension, get a sense for where they're starting with. I did this a lot with kids at Children's Hospital and, and just you know, have a feeling for what a 10 feels like. You know, what does it feel like to bring it down to a 5 or a 2? And, and, and build confidence with the more gross muscle, um, gross kind of feedback, and then more subtle like Duncan's doing with the thermal temperature that's starting to get 
not from the voluntary muscular system, which is EMG, to the more autonomic um, nervous system and the subtler blood flow, and then graduate to the brainwave because it is it is it is helpful to kind of just uh, build confidence and listening to subtler kind of on a continuum. What it might take to do that. <laughs> so what will it take? Will it take him shifting the brain? You know, to do this, he's going to have to control three different um, frequencies of, of EEG all at the same time. And at first, it's kind of like like finding your way into a dark room where there's a light switch and the light switch just comes on when you're uh, when you're in the uh, the right zone um, and gradually you learn how to discern so here the music coming on will tell you you're heading in the right direction signal in the uh, background there. One of the principles of biofeedback is called passive volition. So it's like, oh, those of you who've been in the mindfulness lab a bit, we've talked about intention, attention, and attitude. This core principle is the same thing here. There needs to be an intention, you call it in Kevin's case, you know, to allow that ball to start to move, but without trying so hard that you create intention. So there's an intention, passive volition, it's like doing without without forcing, without trying, without really pushing really hard. It's more of an allowing and inviting, that's the attitude, welcoming, accepting, but holding at the same time is intention and attention. It's super subtle, but as you start to get, you know, imagine, you know, like, like in the case of like when I was doing um, muscle feedback work with people who had strokes, they'd come in and an arm would be limp or a leg wouldn't be working or the face would be really droopy, and you'd hook them up and it'd be sort of like this with the uh, with the gorilla. You'd be going, it's stuck. I can't get it to move, and then all of a sudden it would flicker. You know, and you kind of get, oh, but there's an opening, there's a portal there. How can we find that? And, and that gradually as you begin to, to feel around, you start to find new degrees of freedom that allow you to do moves that you didn't know you could do. So that let's say with somebody with a stroke, maybe the old pathways to use that hand have been totally blown out, but there's workarounds on that and that they can begin to just by randomly feeling around and getting feedback when they're, they're getting hotter, so to speak, they can begin to move in those directions. So the, the main thing is not to get frustrated by it, but to realize that, as you can see with the raw signal here, what's happening is changing moment by moment to moment with the feedback gradually over time you can learn how to influence it. So, uh, 
but just keep in, in mind that sense of uh, with feedback, gradually you can learn how to uh, influence it. And if uh, Kevin had, you know, a bit longer to work with this, he'd be able to roll it over here and then roll it over there and, and open up whole new pathways of, of possibility in terms of neural connections that he could make by being Ooh. able to get the feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. All right. Okay. Fantastic. And with one friend we did this with, it was a woman, kind of a housewife, was feeling a little dominated by her husband <laughs> and not really powerful within herself. She got the gorilla to do this this ball rolling thing with her brain and she has changed their whole relationship. It totally changed their relationship. She has felt so much more confident. And sometimes, you know, even hooking somebody up with the thermal uh, feedback and having them learn that they can warm their hands a half a degree cracks through some old conversation of, oh, I'm powerless, I'm a victim, I can't do anything. And for some people, it just gives a, a greater sense of confidence and dignity and capacity. So. So I think I understand, like, you, you, can, you can monitor the signals that are coming out of your body, but how does Kevin know what to do? You know, generally the instruction I give is watch this and make it as interesting as you possibly can. And you don't have to have a conceptual understanding of what you're controlling. Um, even rats, you can do feedback. If you stimulate their pleasure centers to take their blood pressure up or take it down, they can learn how to, they have no cognitive understanding of what they're doing. That's not necessary to develop the control. All you need is feedback that's meaningful and compelling enough to draw you in that direction. So Kevin, any uh, reflections on what you've been learning or experiencing or noticing as you experimented with it? Just that I don't want to experiment more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and what seemed to shift? Can you, can you describe at all what seemed to shift that allowed you to uh, Get it to be more interesting, or the ball to roll around. Uh, I know, of course, it's trying to figure that out. Okay. Yeah. I know for myself. I'm going to just go back to the other slides here for a moment. Um, I know for myself, the first time I was hooked up, let's say, with the kind of uh, instrument that Duncan's hooked up to here, it could have been hooked up to the table for all I knew. Oops, I just clicked, clicked the wrong. One. Um, <laughs> it could have been hooked up to the table for all I knew. I didn't know what I was doing. Is sort of like learning. <laughs> we don't want to look at my email. <laughs> um, but uh, gradually over time, I begin to distinguish oh, there's this inner feeling of going in the right direction, or a tingling, or a warmth, or kind of inner moves, set of moves that you start to learn with this that really become very clear and tangible over time. So, with kids with neurofeedback, here's a screen where you, you get the leprechaun to go and collect gold coins as he goes along, and, and there can be all kinds of incentives with that. M working with, no, we're not going to go that. Maybe In the extra out. time, we can go do the leprechaun. Yeah, exactly. With uh, the muscle tension feedback, everybody try this. Look at a hand for a moment and pick a finger. And then when I count to three, lift that finger up and touch your nose. One, and be really mindful of how you do this, how you get your hand to move to touch your nose, okay? One, two, three. Touch it with the finger you chose. Okay. Can anybody tell, give me a really good description how you got your hand to do that? Incredibly complicated to do. Any best shots at that? How? Just moved it. I just <laughs> moved it. <laughs> and honestly, you know, I've been at conferences with 24 Nobel laureates from hundreds of countries studying the nature of consciousness and the mind-body connection. Nobody can really explain how we get it to do that other than I wanted to. And somehow that clear intention to have this finger and not that finger do it. We had a, met, a mental map and we're able to, through learning, you know, and 
getting to know our body, we're actually able to have that intention or that visualization activate all the right cascade of millions of micro movements to actually have that happen. The same thing here with muscle tension feedback. You can learn how to get rid of uh, tension headaches, muscle pain. My first teacher with muscle feedback was my grandmother, who used to have to go in for uh, cortisone shots once a month and had really bad migraine headaches. And her brother, who was a doc, said, you should go see this kooky doctor down the hall. He'll hook you up to these machines. At that point, were like big washing machines, you know, with ink pens and things. And, and she, grandma went in and she got rid of her headaches. She got rid of her muscle pain. Every afternoon, she'd do her exercises to relax. Sometimes she'd wake up and she'd say, wow, I woke up with a cold this morning and stayed in bed for 10 extra minutes and got rid of it. So uh, she was the first yogi I ever met. <laughs> in, in uh, we can use biofeedback for heart rate to help people control stress and deal with various cardiac conditions. Heart rate variability is used a lot in terms of stress. Generally speaking, with heart rate variability, you want to have as much variability. Let's say when you try this, reach up and touch your neck, take your pulse, and then find the flow of your breathing. And you'll notice if you really pay attention to this, you exhale, the heart rate slows down. And as you inhale, the heart rate speeds up. And the healthiest condition you get is where there's, a, there's the biggest range as possible between that slow and that fast and the natural range of the breath and the heart rate together, that that gives you greater stress resilience. And people with the smallest range tend to be much less uh, resilient, more prone to stress-related diseases. So you can use the feedback for uh, teaching that can teach people how to breathe correctly. You know, try this, put one sensor on your belly and one sensor up here, and just uh, keep this one uh, still for a moment and just breathe in the upper part of your lungs for a few moments without moving the belly. Okay, kind of a shallow thoracic breath. If you were to do that most of the day, you would be dizzy anxious and stressed. I can guarantee it. Now start to breathe, letting the belly start to move. So as you exhale, the belly comes in a little bit. As you inhale, it pops out. So that you're getting the diaphragm to move and more air to flow. And if you were to breathe in that kind of way, you'd probably get 80, 70 to 80 percent more oxygen to your brain and you'd feel less stressed, less anxious. Um, we can also do that by attaching sensors and hooking up to computers, or you can attach your own sensors. So with the temperature feedback that uh, Duncan was hooked up with, I described that all of these little uh, arterioles um, are lined with muscles, and if we can get feedback on the temperature, then we can learn to increase that. Which we use temperature biofeedback with people with hypertension, migraine. with migraine headaches, Gastro. headaches with gastrointestinal problems, with Raynaud's where the hands get really, the blood circulation gets cut off and the hands kind of turn white and clammy. And in extreme cases, you can get gangrene because your hands aren't warm enough. And um, we can tell you many stories about you know curing people with, with that. Um, there's also for urinary incontinence, which is a huge bundle of health problems and a great cost. Uh, you can teach people with sensors that go into the anus or, or up into the urethra, uh, especially for women, vaginally, um, to control the pelvic muscles and to uh, have greater control of uh, urinary and bowel incontinence, which is a huge industry, honestly, and it's saved a, a lot of people. And one of the main ways that I used um, biofeedback training uh, was That's to teach <laughs> <laughs> was to teach people just how to chill and not feel so anxious or not feel so stressed, which you can do with the thermal feedback or with the skin conductance feedback. Actually, having a cat is a great example because 
if you have a cat, if you've been, you notice like if there's a stressor in the environment, they'll like immediately, you know, be really respond. But then when the stressor moves, they'll just go right back to being mellow and chill. We have that same capacity. What is it within five seconds, Joel? Do you remember the statistic? Yeah. It's something like that. That we have the capacity to 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 drop the stress that way, but we tend to not be in you know, much of our natural state. Um, other mammals, and we tend to kind of keep revving the story, or what was that, or just, but you know, the cat is, is a great example of how to clear just stress and And we can learn that. There's some really exciting uh, applications of neurofeedback for helping people with drug addictions, that is alcohol, different kinds of drug addiction, addictions, which for many people that have an addictive um, propensity, the only time they feel at ease is when they're on their drugs. And it, it just takes them out of the state of, of kind of chronic internal pain into a state of being where they're just not hurting so bad. And what you can do with alpha and theta feedback, training in the slow frequencies that bring people into greater calm, greater focus, greater sense of well-being, which you can also get to through the mindfulness and meditation training. Through neurofeedback, you can help a lot of people how to reset the kind of baseline frequencies that their brain runs at. And as that happens, they don't have any craving anymore for the alcohol or the drugs that they were on because they, in a sense, reset their own baselines for that. Uh, neurofeedback's also being used. It's said that about 8 to 10 percent of school kids suffer from attention deficit disorder which is related to a whole host of different environmental conditions, um, which I won't go into right now. Um, and many, many kids are, are taking medications, and the long-term effects of those medications are really unsettling. Um, there's a lot of good work going on to teach kids how to control their brain waves, to be able to focus more, to calm down, and um, it's extremely effective. Also with autism, there's some, uh, some implications that if you can teach an autistic child to s speed up their brain waves, whereas a hyperactive kid, you want <laughs> to bring them down to the slow ones. For autistic kids, if you can help them boost the frequencies that they're working at, that they tend to normalize. Um, so it's pretty, pretty exciting. Again, with uh, hypertensive patients, teaching them how to relax, Ease, reduces the hypertension, they can get off of the meds, which have a lot of um, frustrating side effects, to say the least. I mentioned the rehab work, um, uh, EMG, the muscle feedback for people with stroke, uh, uh, with people with jaw pain, um, grinding your teeth, it's used for that quite a bit. And there's a lot of work going on with the military right now, just to take these hyper anxious, you know, really ramped up systems that just don't know how to quiet down and to show people where the regulators are for that and how to be able to self-control that. And there's some fun work going on also with couples, teaching couples how to synchronize their physiology. Uh, we did one couples conference of about 150 couples where we took up a husband and a wife and, oh, and we set the parameters so that only when they relaxed together would the music come on, and they both had to be relaxed. If one of them was anxious or trying too hard, the music wouldn't come on, but when they were both relaxed together, then the music would come on, and they'd both have to tune to that in front of 250 other people. And then the sports applications are really great, just helping, um, like, um, with uh, the air gun competitions in the uh, Olympics. Uh, a lot of people have been training with biofeedback on how to take their shot between heartbeats and between breaths so that you, you find that still point of the breath and you find that still point where the heartbeat isn't gonna influence the accuracy of the aim and, and you learn how to shoot in those moments. Uh, a number of teams that um, is the Vancouver Canucks, 
a um, number of other teams. The Canucks actually stopped talking about their mind room because it was a competitive advantage. And at first they were going, oh, this is so cool. And then they realized, we should shut up because the other teams are going to start to get mind rooms with biofeedback and guided meditations and relaxation. So some examples of that. Italy's soccer team. We worked at NASA helping them teach long-range uh, pilots. Going into some of the cool applications, here's a graphic actually that was generated uh, through a fra fractal program that was generated through the patterns of brainwaves. And it's a company called Brain Paint. And uh, at the end here, I'll give you a, a few. Brain Paint. Brain Paint. And uh, they have these like wonderful paint. fractal images <laughs> that get laid down through the patterns of your brain waves in different yeah, mind states. Uh, there's people doing concerts, and this, this one in particular, they had 30 peop di different people <laughs> hooked up with brain sensors measuring different frequencies, and it generated a, con a concert. Um, uh, I will skip the guy who was frozen in the ice. There's <laughs> tremendous gaming implications here. You can imagine uh, five or six special forces troops hooked up with temperature therm. Uh, uh, sensors hooked up to race cars, and the more faster they relax, the more they relax, and the faster they relax, the faster their race car would go. Which and is the opposite. And they'd be competing to see who could win the race by relaxing the most. And the harder they tried, the more <laughs> dead in their tracks they got. <laughs> A lot of virtual reality applications. Here's one of teaching people who had fear of flying to kind of simulate going into an airport, getting feedback on their stress level, going onto the plane, sitting there, bringing the stress level down while they were in the virtual environment. I think we'll skip that. So basically to understand that what we call the body is a multi-frequency phenomenon, that we're broadcasting on many different frequencies, and if we can tune into those, we can begin to uh, control them. So this is some of the farther reaches of it. This is from the Princeton Engineering Department, where for years they uh, were giving people feedback on mechanical systems in distant locations, in the cafeteria, in Seattle, in Mountain View, on the other side of the planet, giving people moment-to-moment -moment feedback on like random ge event generators, generating 0, 01, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, which would, should average out to 50-50, and having people, through getting feedback on these mechanical systems, direct their intentionality to those systems and skew the, the, the distributions on those. And what they found was that the operators, as they began to get into the feedback loop, would be able to actually change the function of these, these electronic systems at a distance with their mind. And each operator would have their own mental, you know, some would be able to have more ones, some more zeros. They'd all be able to influence it differently, but the amazing thing is that how each of them described being able to make the change in the system using the feedback would be exactly like you would describe learning how to control your blood pressure or relax the muscles of your, of your forehead. And the implication here is that maybe our mind and our body are bigger than we thought that they were. And that if we can create feedback loops within that, a whole range of different possibilities may be available that we never dreamt of. So some resources you might want to explore if you want to learn more about biofeedback, neurofeedback, cyberphysiology. There's the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. A lot of research there, one of the best. There's the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe. Thank you to Thought Technologies, whose equipment we're using here. They're based in Montreal. Yeah, really good people. Uh, there's Brain Paint, MindFitness.com, FutureHealth.com. Um, I'll post these on the uh, the Meditation Apps for Googlers website, if you want to follow up on that and, and learn more about this. And um, as we uh, come into the uh, end of the session here, um, just a couple closing thoughts and then we can hook up as many people as we have time for. 
Um, keeping Google in mind, you know, your only real competitive competitive advantage over your competitors is your brain power, your amount of wisdom and access to your knowledge and wisdom. And clearly, the world that we've created with the level of thinking and consciousness that and circuitry that we've relied on so far is full of a lot of problems that we've created. So the solutions really find in opening up new pathways of thinking and neuro neurophysiology. And as we do um, many new capacities and powers and potentials become more accessible to us. So uh, my hopes are that this blitz today of a lot of information will stimulate some questions, some investigations, inspire your meditations, and maybe lead you to make some really cool new apps for uh, some of this technology as it begins to develop. So I'd really welcome any questions or reflections you have. As we're doing that, we can hook some other people up for a while, and uh, you, know, you can have a hands-on experience. And any reflections you might have just as a software engineer or somebody working in a highly technical environment as you look at basically measuring signals, doing something with the information, feeding it back, what kinds of inspirations or ideas might come to your mind? So let's just kind of go free form with questions, ideas, and hooking people up here. And, uh, Thank you to our over. volunteers. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry not to have you on the screen more during this time, but you got a little taste there. So, questions, reflections, yeah, just. And does anyone else want to? Yeah, if anybody else wants to hook up, right. please come. We have the two that we had here, the uh, brainwave and the temp, and we also. Actually, have maybe I'll hook up the skin conductance with somebody. Okay, so we have.